It is recording. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ron Williams. I am a wine professional by day, and I'm here with another wine professional, someone far more experienced than I. Uh, Michael, what do you do for a living? Right now, I sell wine for artisan wines, which is, you know, as the name says, there's wines that are made by artisans. It's not mass produced. You know, small, what you think of as being, you know, boutique wineries. Most of our guys are under 5,000 case production. Um, under 5,000. To, yeah. To put that in perspective, what is the standard, like, big brand? What is their yield usually? Oh, my goodness. I like just millions of cases. Millions <laughs> I mean, of cases. Tens of thousands of cases. You know, so, but our guys are small. Some, some of them have more than that. But on average, we've got you know, about five, 8,000 is, is what we're looking at. Um, and that's for all of their different brands, you know, all their different styles. So you might have a Barolo producer that has a couple thousand cases of one from one vineyard, a, cu a couple thousand cases from another vineyard, a few hundred cases from another vineyard, and then they're, you know, normale. Others got, you know, like Kelly Fox, I, I don't think she makes like less than 2,000 cases of everything all in. And so that's where we are. But if you were looking at, you know, Yellowtail, I mean, that comes over on a tanker, you know, that's just, you know, there's the, the pipeline on the ocean up in Seven. And there's um, everything sort of in between. So we're the small guys. When you think of like a winery and like old Italian guy out in the fields, that's who we are. That's what um, we sell. How long have you been in the wine industry? Well, wine industry per se, like I, my background is mostly restaurants and then country clubs. So I was always tangentially into in the wine industry, always, you know, sold it, you know, one bottle at a time. And then I left the club industry in 2003 um, and wanted to do something. I like that, but I really just getting too old for, you know, running restaurants and dining rooms and shit. So you open up a little wine shop, um, quickly learned how much I didn't know. Um, and then basically have been either retailing and then wholesaling for, you know, since then. So 20 plus years. So wow. been five years with Artisan. Um, and then I, it's, I used to buy from them. One day I called an order in, my sales rep wasn't there, got Rob on the phone. He was like, like, hey, listen, I'm, I'm looking for something. <laughs> so we met and we had, you know, we had wine down at uh, the pizza place in Sono and it was his wines. And I'm, like, yeah, I'm pretty familiar with your book. I, I can certainly fill in some holes. And uh, the rest is history, as I say. Uh, so have you added products? Have you added wines to that portfolio yourself? Yeah, the, the, it, it, it's, it's, it's always evolving. So when I first started buying from them, um, they were always big in Barolo and we're still really big in Barolo. It's probably what we do best. And we had a good amount of Oregon Pinot Noirs, also had a ton of Washington State cabs. Um, we were Casilda Creek, Andrew Will, Seven Hills, um, Scissor G, handful of others. And, and when I had my shop, I used to sell a snot out of it. It was really good. And that market kind of fell apart a little bit. Um, Why either do you got think that some is? of them. Got, well, some of them got to be a little too big for their bridges. Um, got to be very expensive, yeah. and and you know, I have just, an inkling as to who you might be talking. About. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and others, you know, it's it, things just fall out of vogue. You know, they're and, and a lot of them are still good wines, and the ones that are good wines are have gotten expensive. And some of them, you know, when you go from 3,000 to 30,000 case production, not everything scales. Um, so there was some of that going on as well. And, and again, you just, it went out of vogue. It, it, when I was in the wine industry and started, you'd walk into a store and there would be, you know, shelves and shelves, aisles and aisles of wine from Australia. Everything from, you know, the worst of the worst to some really nice, you know, the the Malin Glatzer wines, the, the, the Amon Ra's and those things. And now you go into an, a store and it's, you know, if you can find 20 Australian wines, you're lucky. So I don't think I, I, I can't give it away. I can't give them away. Yeah, exactly. And there's some still, there's some really nice stuff. They just got, you know, a little overdone, Penfold, you know, their own worst enemy in some ways. Like, 
you know, I, I can, it, it's overhyped, yeah. but yeah, I, I've tasted many of the Penfolds. They are outstanding right. wines. They, they exactly. make good wines. I can't argue that. Yeah. Um, and even like the Ben, Got ben Gotzer ones, those are really pretty as well. Just, you know, a little overdone. I think, you know, Sparky Marcus is, uh, could, you know, gets a little port-like sometimes. <laughs> and, and one glass of that is great. And, um, I can't drink that kind of wine like I used to. I can't eat three Big Macs anymore like I used to. So... <laughs> <laughs> uh actually i think it was you who was saying like that that is a that there are um wine dinner wines yes so can you explain the concept of a wine dinner wine <laughs> so there are some things you know there's wine that everybody has a comfort zone there, there are things that you know and you like and you're settled into and you know from going back to my retail days I've always been like a little evangelical about getting people out of their comfort zone. Um, I found that it's easier to do and best to do a little at a time. If your base, you know, you know, your basic Greenwich hedge fund manager is drinking California cab from that he knows from, you know, from Morton's and from uh, Peter Luger's. Nothing wrong with that. They're great. That's not all there is. But you're not going to go to an orange wine right from there. So you kind of drag him out a little at a time. You go from California cats to maybe Bordeaux to maybe a California Pinot Noir, and then to an Oregon Pinot Noir. And then once you get them three or four steps out of their comfort zone, you can go crazy. And then from there, you know, you do wine dinners, you know, and you go to that thing and there's a flight of wines, you know, a, a bunch of meals, uh, different courses rather, and wines that go with each one. And those can be very interesting. However, you know, you, you might fall in love with that, that orange wine. I remember or going to, pairing, um, right? and that pairing can be perfect. That's it. But then you buy a bottle of it or you buy a case of it. And then you take it home and you're like, when the fuck am I going to drink this? <laughs> you know? So um, from a retail point of view, you know, or, or even a wholesale point of view from selling them, those are tricky. You really need to find your outlet and find what you like. Um, we went to Vin Italy, uh, big, you know, Italian wine festival a couple of years ago. It was spectacular. Like learned a lot, saw things that I, you know, I'm the first to admit, like, I, I don't know a ton. And, uh, you know, I go there and I'm happy to be the kid in the candy store. I'm happy to go up to a wine maker and say, show me what you got. Tell me, tell me, tell me about this. I don't need to show off. And, um, we have a pretty good reputation in the Italian wine market as being the right size. We're not so big that your small production wine is gonna get lost in the sauce. And we're big enough that we can, you know, get around the New York, Connecticut area and get you into the right places. And we had a meeting with, somebody had a Lembrusco. And I'm like, I think of Lembrusco as, you know, Reuniti on ice, you know. So nope, we sit down and served me a wine that I have to admit, I didn't realize wine could do that. It was stunningly beautiful. It was a sweet white, uh, red. It was dense. It had some, you know, bitter notes to it. It was stunning. And actually, then to help us out, he served it with like probably one of the best pieces of prosciutto I've ever had. Thirty-six months old, like little crystals sort of floating on the top. It was, you know, sitting in a warehouse eating <laughs> this fabulous food. And then we got the price, you know, the list from him, and we look at it and like. Okay, so that would be like $60, $70 on a shelf in a liquor store. And I look at Rob and I'm like, I could sell maybe two or three bottles of that a year. You know, <laughs> it's great, but no one's going to drink that. And if we could get a, a restaurant to take it and do a wine dinner with it, absolutely. But even then, nobody's going to buy a bottle of it in a restaurant. So it's that was something that was just like you tap your hat to and say, thank you. That was lovely. And uh I'm, I'm happy to know that that exists <laughs> and, and move on. Real, yeah. real nerdy, nerdy wine. Yeah, exactly. And I'm all for like, you know, the nerdy stuff. I, I, I try not to talk too nerdy because that gets, I don't know, it goes over my head at some times. And I think when you're selling to the public, uh, that gets to be a little intimidating sometime. A lot of my viewers are that. nerds though. That's yeah, I know. Like and and I, I don't want to beat up on them. You know, people ask me my strong suit. I'm like, I understand wine geek, 
but I speak English, you know, and I'm happy to translate. <laughs> <for you. laughs> so perfect. So, I understand wine geek, but I speak English. Right. I, I want that. And I, and I sometimes I, I go in over my head a little bit and, and I, I talk some wine geek and, and then I stop myself and realize like, my God, if my brothers ever heard me talking like this, they'd be the shit. <laughs> my brother is, uh, I can't break him out of Burgundy. Hmm. He refuses to even consider, and I got him to taste a Chateau Neuf du Pas, but that's it. He will not break out of Burgundy. How, I mean, how long has he been drinking? About a year and a half, maybe. Okay, so he still has time to go. I do, I, and I used to tell tell this story when I was, I used to, when I had my shop, I used to do a lot of charity gigs, a lot of big events. And this was part of my introduction was I, I did an event one time when I first opened the store, um, I did a gig in Westport and someone came up to me and he was very important um, because he told me he was important. So I knew he was. And he was like, I only drink Bordeaux. All right. And he wasn't talking about, you know, he was talking, you know, first, second, first third growth. growth. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm like, okay, how nice for you. And then I, I, I thought about it for a little while and realized, well, what about Burgundy? What about California Gaps? What about Barolo? What about, you know, that's like saying I only eat filet mignon and there's nothing wrong with that. But what about a ribeye steak? What about pizza and hot dogs? You know, <laughs> those are delicious. <laughs> and if you're gonna be that way, then like, you're, you're just an ass. And then what about when you eat oysters? Are you gonna have Bordeaux and oysters? Oh man. That's like drinking razor blades. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that doesn't work. Hey, some, some people really enjoy a nice sushi with some, some, yeah. you know, Madonna. it makes my feelings hurt. Just thinking about it. <laughs> so anyway, that's where we are. Try, you know, actually as an aside, I've told that story so many times that my wife's friend, Lisa, or my friend as well, used to come to a lot of my events and she would mouth it along with me. She'd be like, I am this important. So hello, it's, Lisa, if you're listening. <laughs> it's so applicable though. Absolutely. Like that, that really speaks to, and I was actually gonna, I was gonna ask you if you had advice for people who are not into wine at all. Like the, only exposure to alcohol is like Bud Light and like shooters of uh, of like Patron and stuff. Like if you want to expand your palate and get into wine, what advice do you have? Find like this is actually advice for everything, and I tell my kids that become a regular. Go find a good wine shop, learn one or two, you know, meet one or two guys, and become a regular. And a good wine shop will keep track of what you purchased, and. You know, I, I know you guys do that. I used oh, to yeah. do that. Oh, yeah. And it's up to you then to keep track of what you like um, and what you didn't like. And sooner or later, a pattern's going to appear. Yeah. I tend to like fruity wines, you know, with medium body and some grip in the tannins, you know, and then from there you do, okay, you explore that. And then from there, you take a step over to something else um you know it might turn out that you like you know spanish grenache I, f I found this great little thing that's really cool so you explore a couple of different spanish grenaches and then you take a couple look at some grenache from the south of france and then you look at some syrah you know some grenache blends you know and then then you just start taking your little baby steps but first you figure out what you like yeah. um, also the other the thing to go is don't Buying the most expensive anything is going to be a waste of money because you're not going to hit the new things, right? So <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Don't start drinking $75 shots in the pot. It's the bits and pieces of it are going to go right over your head. However, the flip side of that is don't buy shit either because then it's just going to be, it's not going to be good and it's not going to be a good example of where you are. It'll put you uh, off. And I picked Spanish Grenache because I used to sell the snot out of it it's I don't have any in my portfolio. You don't have <laughs> and a I think single garnacha in your portfolio? I do, not Spanish. Um, 
And I, there's just for reasons I won't even get into, you know, it's a great value. I think it's one of the best values in the world. You can get a really good $15 Spanish Grenache. You can't get a really good Spanish cab or you can't get a really good California cab. Um, people used to come in my shop and I'm like, I want to spend $15 for a Pinot Noir. No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then again, I was like, here, try this little Spanish Grenache from my buddy Tony. And that's what they were looking for. My Same thing with Chianti. My, they come in yes. looking for like the $10 Chianti. Oh, I can give you a great Italian, you know, Sangiovese for 10, 12 bucks, it's but it's not from Chianti. Chianti on it. Yeah. Right. That's so not realistic. Or, or a wine that you think, you know, a good pizza wine for 15 bucks, but it's not Chianti. So, and so you just have to have that conversation with them and let them know what they need, what they mean, educate them a little bit without being too condescending. You know, yeah, you don't be condescending. I listened to a little bit of the the thing you uh, had with Mark Ancona that um, yeah. sent me, and I liked it. I mean, I enjoyed that, and I, and I could listen to people talk about that all day. I, but you brought up, you know, Fraser and Niles, who yeah. I think I love that show. I mean, funny. <laughs> as shit. But there's just like too many people think wine guys are that. That's the problem. Yes, that's the problem. That's why I sit here in a hoodie when I play video games and drink like right. uh, Ramato style Pinot Grigio. It's like I, I, I want to rid the image right. of the sommelier with the, the you know. Right. Or the pissy old wine snobs who are like, oh, you don't like that. Oh, you don't like that. I used to I do a lot of in-house tastings. And... I'm saying again? I only drink Screaming Eagle. Yeah, exactly. Well, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still convinced, you know, I used to sell to a lot of guys with a lot of money. I, I, I'm, you know, I am perfectly happy to take, I don't want to eat the rich. I don't want to kill them, the rich. I just want to charge them a lot to drink. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, and, you know, I am convinced that most of the first growth Bordeaux's in this country anyway, are drunk by guys at 2.30 in the morning with their other buddies going, I spent four thousand dollars on this. I love you guys, and then they just chug it down, and it's way too young, and it's a little sad, but that's where it goes. What else is new? Um, I. What other rant would you like? Uh, you know what? So like, so so, what do you drink on a regular basis? There's the wine. You really, the wine I, dinner wines. Honestly, you know. I still have a cheap streak and I still show wine for a living. Um, so in September, when we do our big Barolo pre-sale, I drink a load of Barolo <laughs> because, you know, you go around and you show people and at the end of the day, you've got half bottles of wine or third bottles of wine. Barolo, I get two or three days out of it, but still at the end of the week, there's, you know, nice third bottles of wine there and a whole bunch of them. So that's typically I benefited it. from one of those. The very first time we met, you came right. to Putnam and Vine and you had a bot. It was like, uh, it was 10 or 12 bottles of, they yeah. were down to here, but like single vineyard Barolo. That right. was my, the first time I met you. You gave me the remnants of your tasting thing. And I went to these family friends who love Barolo. Yeah, like, just because I can only drink so many of those. It was incredible. <laughs> I just, I have to thank you for that again because yeah. they had been open for days also they were they were open it was amazing well that's you know the 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 and i'm again going back to like you know me and wine and being a learning experience I, i've last couple of years i signed on to the barolo facebook page and i'm very happy to see that it's not just me there's you know true professionals people that you know born up born and raised in barolo who talk about opening a wine and leaving it around for a couple of days and watching it evolve. Um, and when I do that Barolo pre-sale, I mean, we do our big, you know, we do our releases, you know, just so I need to fill people in. They come in in November, we taste them in September because they get air shipped to us and we, and we take orders. So I need to go around and show people any, you know, typically you'd have to work to about a case and a half of Barolo these days, Barolo and Barbadesco. And when I first open them up in Monday, they're just tight as a crab's ass. I mean, they're just wound. They don't taste like anything. They're just wound. And by Friday, yeah, the fruit's starting to fade a little bit. But those middle days, you know, 
Tuesday, you know, Wednesday and Thursday, Wednesday. those wines are showing their best. I mean, clearly they're young and they, they need some time and they have to come together. And there's still a couple of guys that I, I show them to on a Thursday and they get all pissy with me. Like I need to see what they look like when they're first open. I'm like, I don't look like anything when they're first open. They're, it's like drinking a rock. It's, it's tight. It's hard. You know, it does. <laughs> what, um, what do you think has, because previously, like, you know, throughout Barolo's history, that was not something you could even consider drinking young, right? No. Barolo needed to age for like at least a couple decades. Yeah. So what changed? Well, what changed? So, uh, I mean, are you familiar? I'll, again, bring up to speed. I don't know if you saw that movie, The Barolo Boys, which kind of is this, it's a good little documentary. It's got Joe Bastianich before he was important in narrating it. And it was about the birth of the, you know, the, the modernization of the Barolo industry. There's also a little things in general. You go and you visit Barolo and the area and the buildings, most of them are ancient and old. Yeah. But as a wine region, like it didn't get its DOC until, I want to say mid 60s. It didn't get a DOCG until mid 80s. It didn't really start to like take form in many ways that we know it until then. Before then it was negociants that were yeah. buying it and then making a house blend. Um, the market was the market was kind of stupid back then. <laughs> I mean, people knew, you know, they knew France, they knew, um, you know, they, they knew Bordeaux, they knew uh, Burgundy. The American market was not really as big as it was. The Asian market certainly wasn't there. Sure, the European market was there, but you know, so they they really didn't take form as we know it till much later, till till you know second half of 20th century so there's that okay and again one of the scenes that this just set it up for you uh elio what the hell's his name starts that he's not making a ton of money um he goes up to burgundy he sees how one of the burgundy winemakers is driving a his porch to go skiing and he's making tons of money so he's like oh i want to go do things like that and then he's went back and he started making very modern style and the, and then the, they became way too modern in a lot of people's minds. And then the traditionalists sort of took over again. And the one part that really I think gets overlooked is when they were talking about his, um, his winery in the beginning of the movie and his, what his father and grandfather were doing. They were talking about that's where they kept the chickens was where they made the wine. That's where the cans of gasoline were, was where they were making the wine. So the traditionalists definitely needed to have a kick in the ass. I don't think they needed to have the kick in the ass quite that hard right. <laughs> that they were the making direction. some of the wines that they were yeah. making. You know, what, what is the biggest, like if you were to taste a more like traditional style versus a modern style, what is the difference in terms of the drinking experience? Well, you know, when you talk about the more, again, the pendulum, when it was swinging back then, yeah. they were picking grapes when they were still pretty green. They were picking everything. Um, so they were, they were not green, green, but not as, as ripe as they could be. Without they were going into development. really long extractions um you know skin contacts that were very very long and then they would go into these big giant when i say big i'm talking like the size of a of a you know hundred thousand liters this, it looks like a um it looks like a cargo container made out of wood but it's round i mean it's on its side i've got pictures i could send to you they're taller than me they're you know and that's just and then they go back another 20 feet so they massively they would just put them in that and wait for the tannins to soften up. And by the time that in many cases, when the, by the time the tannins softened up, you know, the fruit was gone. And then, so the modernists are like, okay, we're going to put into small barrique you know, and we're going to let things, we're going to do some green harvesting and we're going to, um, which is just cut away a bunch of the grapes. And so they get better, you know, before they ripen when they're small, it's called a green harvest. So you, all of the energy of the plant goes into a few clusters. Oh, it concentrates uh, more. And concentrates and everything. And, okay. and then they would let them ripen a lot longer. Um, 
And then they would go into Barrique, which, and a lot of these guys were doing used Barrique or, or new Barrique rather, which was a small barrel. So you get a lot of oak flavor on it. And they were making, you know, California cab. Basically <laughs> making California and cab again, with, with Nebbiolo. Right. I have nothing against California cab. I love it. It's gotten too expensive to get good ones. Um, but, you know, not everything has to taste like that. Not everything has to taste like filet mignon. There's other flavors. Involved. And then the pendulum swung back the other way. And, you know, a lot of the traditionalists, and I tend to be an old school person in general, They're like, I'll, I'm willing to change, but you need to give me a reason to change. I'm not going to, you know, just change because for the sake of changing. Um, so, yeah, there was a reason to change. When you look at, the, at those opening scenes when there's just like gasoline and chicken shit I mean, <laughs> next to the fermenter, it's like, this, like, hmm. And, and the pendulum has swung back. So you end up with, um, you know, a lot of our guys, you know, it's like Fratelli Alessandro, who's always had a clean, you know, always had new barrel or doesn't use new barrels. Um, they're not the big giant ones. He does some, you know, the, the long extractions, but he does them under control. He lets his fruit get ripe, but not overripe. Um, and it works out well. We know, we have, you know, I know you've tasted Silvano Balmada from this. Yes. So Balmada does ridiculously long extractions he's his reserva has upwards of 100 days of skin contact how does how does that work like when it's extracted for that long doesn't that extract so much tannin like it'll feel like sandpaper if you drink this? it does and and it could and i wish i could give you more of the scientific i mean he's explained it to me a couple of times on on his process and it kind of like it's like listening to a lecture to sort of, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but then I go to teach it back to you, I'm not there. So I can't tell you exactly how yeah. he does it. But what happens is, so tannins um, are, you know, carbon chains with free open ends on them, right? Yes. And those open ends will bind to proteins, fats, and each other. And when they're young, and there's a lot of those ends, they bond chemically to the inside of your mouth because yeah. we're made out of protein and fat. That's yep. what we are. Yep. Um, and as they get older, they will naturally find each other and align. And so the tannins are there and they have weight, but there's fewer of those receptors on the end. And then when it, sometimes they get so big, they precipitate out of the bottle and that's why you get sediment, you know, it traps some other things that are in there. Um, so, but he does these long extractions and does some temperature manipulations. Um, so that polymerization happens in the bottle or in, in the in the keg oh, rather in the, the cask. in the tanks or the cask okay right so during the aging process so he so if you taste his younger wines the tannins are there i mean they're but they're not holy shit i need to have a piece of you know cheese to to, <laughs> to get this out of my mouth they're weighty and they're then they're going to grow uh, but as, and the, the flip side of that is while those tannins are softening over the next couple of years, the fruit is intense. Yeah. So, so when you're talking young old, would he be a modernist? Uh, maybe not. I mean, he's, his fruit's not getting so ripe that it's cooked. You know, yeah. it's, it's not blueberry pies. It's, it's blueberries, you know, or, or, or it's not balance. cherry pie rather, it's cherries. I'm saying again? He found balance. Exactly. And that's what all of them are doing now for the most part. There's a handful of guys who are just like, why are you making this? <laughs> and there's a couple that are still, you know, a little bit more. So we have Francesco Ronaldi. I think he's a little more traditionalist or she is yeah. um, that those wines need a little bit more time to, to soften. I think they take a little bit there. There tend to be a little bit less ripe, I think when they when they pick them doesn't mean that they're not going to be gorgeous um they just need a little bit of time to, to come together for telly alessandra i think is about as textbook down the middle as you get i mean just pretty beautiful clear um approachable but you know you know I, i'll wait to drink this because i know it's going to be better yeah take your time wine. yeah exactly and then back to you know Balmuda big beautiful gorgeous wines but still very much an expression of nebbiolo and where they come from they're not he doesn't muck it up with a lot of new wood it's nebbiolo from this part of the world there's a slightly different way of looking at it that makes sense yes 
Yes, it okay. does. Because you can, you know, I can, I can talk about them a lot, and sometimes it's just, I love it. what is that guy saying? No, no, it's no, all no. just a different way of saying it tastes good. <laughs> when when you're selling, is that your the main point you hit? It's just you just walk in and you're like, it tastes good. Here you go. Yeah, and then some people want a little bit more, <laughs> but my my coworker Jim Morrison. Um, you know, you, you look at guys online and they post different things, you know, about wine. And, you know, he often will just say, wine is delicious. And like, you know, I can argue with Jim about a lot of things, but not that, you know, it's wine is delicious. He's yes, right. I agree with statements that, uh, that are true. Yeah. Um, there we are. Bell Pen. Yes. What can you tell me about that Pinot Noir? So that is my good buddy, Brian O'Donnell. Okay. He is classic example of, you know, he, he calls himself a wine grower, not necessarily a winemaker. Um, a wine grower. Yeah. Can you so he's that? the nicest guy, one of the nicest people in the world. And just the classic story of kind of an old hippie who made a bunch of money and checked out. It's like, I'm going to go settle in and I'm going to buy a bunch of land. Most, all of his land is not under um, grapes. I mean, he's got some apricots and some barley and stuff. So he's, oh, wow. you know, a bit of a, a bit of a farmer. Yeah. Um, and he's looking to make, he works out of a couple different vineyards. He's got his own vineyard, which is the Belpont Vineyard in Yamhill Carlton. And then he, Mike Murto has a vineyard that he buys some fruit from and he makes a, a Murto vineyard. Um, and he makes what you think of as just like a farmer who's, you know, tending his crops and making it into the best wine that he possibly can. And looking for just an expression of what that particular land comes from. Um, and Oregon, he described one day as kind of cool. So there was a lot of it's in that area where the, the glaciers came down and then there was a lot of flooding. So there's a lot of different um, geologic, you know, activity over the last, you know, million years or so. Yes. yes. And then there's all of that beautiful layers. And then you've got some tectonic activity there as well. So it all just sort of gets crumpled up. And as he put it, you know, it's like somebody made a 14 layer cake and then dropped it because <laughs> I could be standing in in where I am in, in Yamhill Carlton and look across the river uh, or across the valley rather and Dundee, the land is a million years different because it turned. Wow. So you get very different expressions of- That kind of um, variation in the right. soil and the geological features, that reminds me a lot of Burgundy. Very much so. So um, if you talk to, you know, the, the, the nexus for our portfolio, you know, when you talk to Rob, my boss, his first love is Burgundy. Burgundy's just freaking expensive and yeah, spoken nice. for and, and hard to come by. And, and so the sort of nexus, then the two things, you know, the Venn diagram that overlays with nexus is, is Oregon Pinot Noir, because it's the same grape. And you, like you said, it's that same expression of where it comes from when it's done right. Um, and Nebbiolo, again, Nebbiolo and Pinot Noir are first cousins genetically. And Barolo is that same, a lot of different terroir and good winemakers that are making an expression of where that comes from. Um, so there, there is certainly a bead there. There is certainly a, an overlap in the Venn diagram between, hmm. between those. Uh, and, you know, said, elegance. Uh, elegance. Elegance right. and nuance are two right, exactly. things right. that like is like, I feel like there are very much two schools of thought there. And those are the two. There is the Bordeaux, higher manipulation, bigger, bolder, sledgehammer to right. the palate kind of thing. And then the more delicate, nuanced, elegance, understatedness of let the vines do their thing. Would you say that originated in Burgundy? Like making, let, Probably, the, yeah. let the terroir shine through, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And you, you can certainly see some of that in Burgundy, you know, Bordeaux as well. I'm not, you know, you're not going to, no, 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 I didn't, a I'm little not, bit I more underhanded at Bordeaux. I love Bordeaux. I have yeah. some Bordeaux also. Like, yeah. A little more in your face, a little more all at once. But yeah. 
and, and both Pinot Noir and Nebbiolo are grapes that are very sensitive to where they're grown and it shows up in where they're grown. So we have two vineyards that um, from Cantina del Pino. And normally when you walk through a vineyard, you can tell sort of when you're going from one vineyard to the other, there's a change in elevation, there's a change of exposure. You go around an, uh, you know, an outcropping somewhere, I'm like, okay, I'm somewhere else. You're not always right, but you can sort of see the difference. So there is a stretch of Albasani and Avello that touch each other with two vineyards from Cantina del Pino. And uh, Renato treated those exactly the same all the time. Just pick them in more or less at the same time. And if it weren't for the signs on the little posts, you wouldn't know you were crossing from one vineyard to another until they're in the bottle. And then after two years, you're like, my goodness, these wines are, they're not apples and oranges, you know, it's two different kinds of apples. It's Gala apples and Golden Delicious. I mean, but clearly they're both- distinct that, but, difference. but they're distinctly different. Yeah. And if what, you look at the, the soil, it's, uh, Albasani tends to be a little bit more feminine, if you will. It shows higher notes, a little okay. bit brighter. Okay. Avello's a little bit, and we're talking, but you can tell. And the difference is really just um, some trace elements in the soil. The glacier that came down and shoved whatever, you know, it was shoving, and as a couple hundred parts per million of XYZ element is different in Albasani than it is in Novella. And the and it shows up in the Nebbiolo. It doesn't show not every grape would do that though. So that's what he does. And that's and that's the cool thing when you put those side by side. I was um again, I'm I'm not sure that I could do this, but I was having lunch with Kelly Fox, another one of our winemakers. Oh and, um, yeah. And she's a delight. She, the woman, I mean, and I don't think that she would disagree. I think if she, she is more of the earth than anyone I've ever worked. And I, and I truly believe that if she could put down roots, she could. I mean, just like one of those old romance novels, like a, you know, like a, like a Hans Christian Andersen tale, you know, she just sort of <laughs> went into the vineyard one day and <laughs> there was an extra vine. Um, so we're, I'm, you know, bitching about uh, William Selling which is lovely California Pinot Noir. And they've gotten to where there's so many different bottles. And I was joking that it's like each vine has a name. There's West each Block, West Block E, West Block West M. And when you're on their mailing list and they send you this stuff and they're like, take all your allocation. And, I, and, she, and I'm thinking like, it's a marketing tool. And she like looks at me and all her and she says, no. When you line them all up, it's like drinking a topographical map of the area. Oh, that's oh. interesting. <laughs> she does. She basically does like biodynamic. Um. Like, yeah. Yes not, and no. Not official certification, whatever. No. But in the sense that, like, does she does she pick and and do things in the vineyard according to the lunar cycle? Because I know that's a big part of what the biodynamic. I, I honestly, I. I believe she does. I know. I talked to Brian about that, and he's like. All things being equal, I'll, I'll defer to that. There are times, there are things, you know, that he'll say that I don't think are appropriate. Okay. You know, okay. that they want you to do that I don't think are not only not necessary, but just not appropriate to do. He goes, so that's why I don't do it. But all things being equal, yeah, I'll defer to the person. Kelly's very much the same way. I mean, she's, she's very much in tune with, I mean... <laughs> She tells the plants. <laughs> she tells the moon what to do. Yes. <laughs> she is very much the force in tune with, with her. I'm sorry? The force is strong with her. Exactly. And, and I'm saying this all in a good way. I mean, and she's smart as, as, as they come. Um, and, and But just, and goes out and prunes and does everything she needs to do with, it, with them every day. And knows, I don't think she really needs the moon to tell her what to do. I would love She's to ask like her about that. that in tune with stuff. her. And her wines are stunning. Her wines are beautiful. Yes, yes, they are. No question about that. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, she uses sulfur. <laughs> I know, but... Again, to quote, to you know... With it. To but quote my my, uh, my co-worker, Jim Morrison, you know, sulfur is not a crime. <laughs> sulfur is not a crime. And who was the one who says, um, I put my milk in the refrigerator, I put sulfur in my wine? I believe that was Kelly. That yeah. is Kelly Fox. Okay, Kelly Fox. I, I, just don't hold me to that. I think that was her who said that. All right. 
but so, you no, know, I, I I'm okay with a little bit. Yeah. I'm okay. With a there are bit. far worse things you can do to wine that would keep it organic. You know. Yeah. See, that's what turn on the like. Turn on the water. turn on the sprinklers. Irrigate. Just you can irrigate the shit out of your wine. Add that much more water, and you ruin the entire batch. And it's still Just organic. Because, it's still organic. You know. Okay. McDonald's sells organic food, so. <laughs> <laughs> we give you some idea of just how much of that, you know, carries. There are, I mean, I appreciate the idea of yeah. not manipulating wine, of, of it showing it the way it needs to be shown. Be the, be the broiler chef that just shows off the meat, not the saucier that covers it up. But don't, you know, don't not cook the meat because that's interventionist. Yeah, you know, can't you, cook the meat. Just you have to do something. Do its thing, all right? Right. <laughs> so, so that's all. That's that's my my two cents on it. And there's you know I, I find there's without going off on too much of a rant. There's too much like hocus pocus out there. People who talk about um, what gives you a headache, what doesn't give you a headache, what's good for you, what's bad for you. You know, it's just, you make your own choices, but look past whatever label they happen to be slapping on it because- Look past the marketing. The, look past the marketing, also look past the government regulation. You know, USDA organic, the more you look into it, I'm like, where the f did they come up with some of those figures and some of the ideas? You know, organically, I can go into the whole foods, right? buy whatever product they have on the shelf in a can that's called organic and it will have salt in it. That's allowed under organic. So when I went to college and I took organic chemistry, if it didn't, if there wasn't a carbon molecule, if there wasn't a carbon chain and it didn't support life, then it wasn't organic. That's what organic means, right? Yes. This is not, <laughs> this is not something new. It's not new. This isn't so, new. So if they can put in sodium chloride into an organic product and still call it organic, why can't I put in sodium dioxide and call it organic? Because really, neither of them are organic. Both of them act as preservatives. What the Sulfur fuck? Sulfur dioxide in wine. Ah. Makes it not organic. Yes. But like... Right? But the sodium chloride in food like makes it. is okay. Right? You follow my logic here? I do follow your <laughs> logic. All right. So that's... Again, somebody's out there is going to read this or rah, 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 and it. get really pissed because, you know, well, no, I, I touted the benefits of like feeling better from biodynamic wines. But then I kind of I think I narrowed it down. I don't know so much if it was the sulfur, but like a lot of the tannins can really mess with me. That's typically what gives people a headache is that when they talk about just having like that little sinus headache, it's not very different than going out after into a garden. You're, there's there's irritants and tannins are irritants. Yeah. And you get a histamine reaction. Exactly. Whether and that's also sense. why one wine will give you a headache and another won't. Just like grass seed won't give you a headache. Ragweed does. You know, golden rod will. Yes. So just keep track of what, of what it works for you. Um, and do you know what else gives you a headache really bad all the time, every time? Alcohol. Oh, see? Oh, son of a bitch. And I'm not having wine without alcohol. Yeah, no, that then that's not what that's called a lie. Yeah, exactly. I don't do that. So, anyway, let's circle back to good things. I, I'm not. I'm. No, no, we're no, not going to grind mean, my gears. We're here not going to. No, but but it, it is fun to rant sometimes. Um, I enjoyed your um, description of kombucha because I am, I right. I am a be, uh, I'm a fan of the benefits of kombucha. I'm not a fan of the experience <laughs> of ingesting kombucha. Mm. Um. What do you it, it, it tastes like wine flaw. It, it tastes, tastes like, like somebody flaw. didn't let their, it's the fermentation that didn't happen completely. <laughs> wine flaw. It, and, and not flawed wine. It's the thing that makes wine. the wine bad. It's it's th right. the actual flaw in the wine. That's what kombucha right. tastes like. It's, I'm not banning it, but I will make fun of my children for drinking it. <laughs> um, do you think that's a useful tool? 
in tea What's because that? a lot of people actually have something I've learned is people actually do have a hard time identifying flawed or faulty wine. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Do you think kombucha is a helpful tool? It's like if it if you smell something that smells like kombucha, probably not good wine. You got a bad bottle. Right. Yes. Um, I mean that's true of anything. You know, if you're tasting, you know, burnt almonds, if you're tasting sherry, you know, those are flaws in your wine. Um, you know, on the upside as well, I think it's it's handy for people to understand, you know, getting back to wine is delicious and everything after that is just a subset of wine is delicious. So all those tasting notes are just what kind of delicious. <laughs> what kind of delicious is this? Right. So I think it's handy for people to identify and be able to see what things taste like. So, you know, just the next time you're eating a raspberry, pay attention to exactly what that raspberry tastes like. Pay, you know, the next time you're sniffing a yeah. tangerine peel, pay attention to what that tangerine peel tastes like. Star is, it's, it's really easy. We did this back when I was in college. Um, they, there was a, a, like a, a little test you do of blindfolding and identifying smells. Oh, I need to do that. Totally humiliating. Um, <laughs> just, but the things that people, this interesting I thought was the things that you don't like, you can identify really quick and easy. Oh. Like somebody can, oh, I, I don't like the smell of anise. Mm -hmm. That makes me a bad Italian, I know. Um, no, it doesn't. But if I somebody like- anise as well. Yeah, it's but if somebody like- Italianness. <laughs> But you can open a bottle of Sambuca three doors away. And I'm like, oh, there's Sambuca over there because you can smell it. The other, like if between a strawberry and a raspberry, I'm like, eh, stop and think for a minute. Like there's some red fruit in there. What kind? Yeah, let, me, let me think about it a little bit. <laughs> there's like, yeah, because it's like you got to, it's tough. It's tough to do that. Yeah. Floral uh, aromas as well. I have yeah. a harder so, and, time you know, doing, differentiating floral aromas. You know, it's something you like. It's all good. It's a good so aroma. It's, just you keep dying to, yeah. It helps. And that just really helps for the describing of what's what. What's, you know, and keeping track of what you like. I like so, that. I like that. That's where we are. Do you advocate for keeping a tasting journal? Julia says hello, by the way. She was on a previous episode two times Ooh. ago. Julia from Putnam and Vine. Oh, how the hell is Julia? Julia Putnam and Vine. She's doing great. Right. She's in Colorado. She, we talked about uh, horseback riding. She is quite the equestrian. Um, God bless her. She's doing oh, yeah, I remember great. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I so love Julia. She says too. hi. Um, Good. <laughs> but uh, do you, she advocated for keeping a tasting journal. It's like, even if it's something as simple as I smell apples or I taste apples when you taste apples, like... Is that helpful for you? Yeah, I, I I do advocate for it, but like so many things, I, I don't do it myself. I have, I mean, it's a great idea to get up and exercise every morning, but shit, <laughs> it's not easy. I haven't done that in a while. So yes, I would I would think that if you're really if you're looking to learn, absolutely, keep track of what's what. Just in general, just keep track of what you like, what you don't like, you know, have a, get a little bit of base knowledge, you know, this is what, you know, for people who are, don't know a whole lot about it and then just take it from there. Um, I, I used to, again, I used to tell people like get, get a good book. You start with, I'm looking at my Oz Clark book at this point and you read the first chapter or two about like the basics of wine. But when you get into each region, you read like the first five pages. And then after that, it's it's gonna stop making sense because you don't know what the hell they're talking about. So if you're gonna read Barolo, you read the first three pages of Barolo, then go drink a whole load of Barolo and then go back then and read the next three more pages of Barolo and then read until like, okay, I understand all this. I'm gonna read two pages past that. Then go drink a load more Barolo <laughs> and then like, oh, okay, now that'll all make sense again. And then do that with each of your regions, don't, but just, you know, to be memorizing everything is kind of silly. You That's know, the mistake I delicious. made initially. Right. I was doing too much textbook yeah. stuff and not enough like real what like the most helpful thing rather than studying is tasting. I would rather have tasted more wines than books I had read about wine. Right. Not the absolutely. Other way but, the, but you got and you but you just sort of you need to overlay that with like, okay, what the hell was that? That was really good. 
why was that good? perspective you need a little bit of baseline right. line knowledge yeah yes. exactly and so it's so it's i think it's a little bit of bouncing back and forth it's also like drinking with people that know more than you you know just all right i love working you know my some of my counterparts some of my co-workers are like i hate doing um you know winemakers you know work with winemakers i, I absolutely love it why just Would fill in the gaps of stuff like working with the winemakers because it can be it can be hard it's hard work it's not as easy as it seems you know and if you're like in the city you'd have to make appointments and everybody wants to be at the same time and some of the winemakers can be well we'll just say they're colorful they're <laughs> artists <laughs> they're characters yeah they're all nuts in one way or shape or and i say that truly God bless them, but you know, in, in all different ways, but they're all nuts and that's what makes them great. Um, what the hell was I saying? Oh, so yeah, work with your winemakers. I also like working with people who know less than me. Same that it's going back to like when I used to study, you know, in college. If you can teach somebody something and you find, and you know, you think you know something, but you're like, wait a minute, I need to explain this more thoroughly. And then you go look it up and like, oh, that's what it is. And that's fine. And then you, if you and then can't it all, like, explain it, you don't understand it. Yeah, exactly. So that's 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 better. So that's where we are. That's that's my two cents. That is incredibly helpful advice. I think that's incredibly helpful advice. Uh, not just a crabby old man. <laughs> Many other. Uh, just a crabby old man. It can be, but not always. <laughs> um, we are coming up on almost an hour. I don't oh my goodness! Too much more of your time. Time flies. I know. It does. Um, is there anything you want to add? Any questions you have for me? Any dilemmas? Any comments? Any parting advice? No, just again, just uh, I, I really just can't stress enough in general, you know, of becoming a regular at a wine shop or just in general in life, you know, get to know your bartender, tip him well, you know, and, and life will be good. You'll always get good service. Become a become a regular. You know, I just bought a new Toyota and same place. It's our sixth Toyota. <laughs> Six Toyota from that same place? From the same store. And the guy, and they've been doing it for 25 years now. None of them are new, by the way. All just used. And the guys are like, God bless you for coming back. And, you know, you get the frequent flyer miles and, you know, they take care of you to get, you know, little bits and pieces. It pays it's, to it's establish just, relationships. You right. Know? I'll go just, again, in the store when I had my shop, and the spectator top 100 was like a big deal. I would, you, they would release the numbers, right? As they came out, I think, are they still doing that? Oh yeah. So, and if I had anything on the shelf, I would immediately take it down. <laughs> like if I had three cases of something, I'm going to put that in the back room and I'm going to call up the guy who has been buying that wine for the last, or somebody similar. I'm going to call up one of my regulars, John, I, this got just got number six. I've got two cases of it. If you want it, yeah, great. But I'm not like f-ing cherry pickers coming in. Somebody's coming in, you know, shows up with the oh, list yeah, tucked yeah, up yeah. under their arm. Yeah. Get out of here. I used to love to when people would come in, like stick their head in the door. Do you have any Pappy Van Winkle? Oh my God. Say, like, Do you know how many times we get people asking for the antique collection of Buffalo Trace? People out of state, like, you've never been here before. We've gotten two oh, bottles yeah. since we've been open. Yeah, exactly. I would take their all their information down. Here, fill out this form. Like, f- you. You're going to waste my time. I'm going to waste yours. <laughs> if I thought of it, I'd ask for a credit card number. You know, just. <laughs> but even so, oh, no, you know, let me find out for you. Let me get your contact information. I'll call you when it comes in. <laughs> just <laughs> idiots. To put it in perspective for people, um, Pappy Van Winkle goes now, now goes for, I think even just the 15 year is like 1500, 2000 for a bottle, yeah. for a 750 milliliter bottle. Burp. Exactly. And it all gets consumed at 3.30 in the morning after the tequila. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> I love you. Oh, I mean, God bless him. It, it cannot possibly be worth it. Like the wines that go. So for example, I'm not, I, this is not a slight against DRC, but like most expensive wine that has ever been sold in history, a bottle right. of 1945 uh, DRC 
right? How could that possibly come close to being worth half a million dollars? No, I don't it's understand how collector stuff. Just collector stuff. Absolutely. So I've got my one DRC story for you. I'm working last year on a charity um, up in New Canaan, a charity gig, and they do a um, uh, they do a bottle grab. So you you donate a bottle anywhere from seventy five to two hundred dollars. They sell the bottles grabs, you know, brown paper bag for I think like a hundred. I'm familiar with this bucks. charity. I think I've right. I've wor- I've donated to this charity. <laughs> it's the get about. So I, I know Jono who's doing the um, who's doing the, the collecting and he's trying to get some pricing so he knows what you know what things are. And he sends me a picture. Somebody donated it a a, 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 a Latosh nineteen ninety <laughs> for the fucking bottle grab. Nice way to live in New Canaan. So I'm like, Jono. That's Latosh, not the bottle. Nineteen ninety. I need. Hold on. Spare with me for it, one moment. It, so a DRC Latosh. It, it, Six thousand dollars is what we got for it. You're kidding me. No. So I'm like, dude, that's not a bottle grab thing. If it is, I'll give you three hundred for it right now. So hooked him up with a guy I know that deals in that kind of stuff. Ten percent surcharge. They got, um, or ten percent finder's fee. They got six grand for the, uh, for the charity. I'm at a cocktail party like a year later and I run into the guy who donated it. I knew him. He's like, I heard that. He's like, I, when I, I bought that for like $300 when it was first released, <laughs> he goes, I had no idea. <laughs> I'm like, you got any more? He goes, that was my last one. He's like, I'm f-ing. he was pissed. I'm like, dude, just like, show me what else you got in your cellar. And before you go giving stuff away. People don't know what they have. So, God bless them. <laughs> wow. And on that so, note... <laughs> all right, yeah, exactly. Do the bottle grab. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> Do the bottle grab. Um, is uh, is there any, like, uh, contact information for Artisan Wines or something you want me to put in the description or anything like that? Do you have any social media you want to do or just, just this was just very... I don't have any social media. Okay. Um... Now, Artisan Wines Inc. I'm I sell basically from Westchester to I'm sorry from Westport to the Hudson River. I don't go into the city, but if you're in Westchester or Lower Fairfield County, I mean, I'll you really you know fall in love with me and need me to go up into Connecticut. I will. If not, I'll refer you to Jim Morrison, my my coworker, who will give you who knows much more about our portfolio than I do. Um, and take it from there. Happy to. We sell, you know, fine wines to the to the and the to the retail and the uh, restaurant market. That's it. What else is there? N- nothing, as there should be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, Michael, thank you so much for your time. All right, Ron. Um, it was an absolute pleasure. I uh, I hope to have you again. Perhaps uh, maybe a little round table. We'll get Mark and and who knows, maybe somebody else. I think that absolutely be- get. Get Julia. And I'm Julia, with her. yes. I would love to have have people on. Yes, Julia. All righty. You guys, take cool. care. Make sure you run this by the Photoshop, guys. Make me look younger and skinnier. And, oh, uh, no, we'll, we're going to do a deep fake. We're going to make you look like uh, Brad Pitt. <laughs> good. All right, man. Be good. Ciao.